You are listening to Ace Comicals. I'm Greg Driver. I'm joined by Rahul Johnny and Leon Everett. Let's go! And welcome to Ace Comicals episode 108. And today it is just me and the usual suspects, Leon. Hey, hey. And Rahul. Hey, guys. Yep, yeah, so... Um, I mean, like... WandaVision's finished. Um, we've got... Snyder Cut and... <laughs> And we've got the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and I never thought I'd say this, but I've got more to say about the Snyder Cut than I have about the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Yeah, because there's 40 <laughs> minutes of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, but there's four hours of Snyder Cut. Of course you've got more to say about it. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, like, the thing that is, it's here now, like, the thing that we've been kind of, like, slyly making fun of for the past however many episodes... Yeah, so, so tee this up for someone on the planet who has no idea what a Snyder Cut is. <laughs> Back in 2017, in the old days, when we were allowed <laughs> to go and meet in public and things like that, there was this film called um, Justice League, which was released, and it was a film about the Justice League. And it was supposed to be... Um, it, well, it was it was DC's follow-up film to... Batman versus Superman, and it was meant to be their Avengers, right? So they were they were trying to get in on the MCU stuff, and they were trying to build their own answer to the MCU, and and have this popular film um, series or franchise that everyone would love and adore, and you know it would be like the the DC kind of answer to the to the MCU or whatever. But it failed miserably because everything was all over the place and disjointed and there was woes there was production woes because um well like something this is, it was quite tragic actually because uh, something like Zack Snyder's daughter passed away um and he and his wife left production of the um cuz they were they they left production of the justice league film heart like sort of like halfway through and uh warner brothers and dc kind of like grabbed joss Whedon to finish it off and i don't know like whether well, he... the there's a few more wrinkles in that because yeah. apparently as reporting came out like over the last couple of months um because of the critical drubbing that batman versus got batman versus superman got and um the sort of call for a, a move away from such a dour tone and stuff. Uh, WB were already like hassling Snyder to make things more cheerful. And when they watched the original cut before um, uh, we didn't become involved, they weren't not happy. So I think from what I remember, the Whedon was brought in before the Snyder's left uh, as like to rewrite scenes. And then Snyder was going to shoot, those rewritten scenes as part of reshoots and then mm. the the family tragedy happy happened which led to um the snyders uh leaving their roles as um director and um producer respectively yeah and uh what we were left with was like the the, the film that we got basically in 2000 2017 which was very very badly received um and it was a terrible mess. it was relatively at the box office as well yeah, it was like completely incoherent. Like it, it, it was it was a terrible movie, and it basically just put the nail in the coffin for DC's, um, <laughs> the DC EU. Yeah, the DC EU, DC's answer to the MCU. Um, and I think like we basically we got we got this kind of like fan movement. Like the, the the quick way to put it is, there was a fan movement in favor of releasing the Zack Snyder version, which would be like the purely Zack Snyder version with you know his his kind of like his his original vision 
and um there was like this whole fan campaign and a lot of toxic fans got behind it <laughs> and uh they they won <laughs> <laughs> They got their, they got what they wanted. They got the Snyder Cut. Um, it was, you know, it was, they said they were going to release it and then they released it this year, like last week, last Thursday. Um, and it was one of those things where on the lead up to the release prior to it, it was, it was like, I know, I know for us, especially us guys, we were thinking this is going to be some kind of talk. This is going to be some kind of weird hot mess. Like, a lot of people were, no one was really that interested. Everyone was more about it, it like it, mor- morbidly curious is probably the best way I can put it for like well, what probably what most people were feeling. Well, that's the thing. I think it was like a mix of things because you had the the release of Snyder Cut people and yeah. that is a wide, wide spectrum of people from people who just really love Zack Snyder's movies and wanted to see the director get his cut out there and also to the the more toxic sides of the fan base who are like, um, every other thing like uh, Marvel and blah 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 is um, uh, like woke garbage and stuff. We, we want the real action stuff. So you had mm-hmm. that sort of contingent, but like it, it's a it's a broad spectrum because there's a lot of people who are on the other side and just in the middle who just wanted, who just yeah, just wanted uh, like more of the uh, Snyder's take on on those characters. Yeah. So and then there's people who are outside of that who. Or either like uh, burnt out by like Snyder films, or just not don't like them in the first place. Who are kind of like just watching by the sidelines, thinking like, th- like this isn't going to happen, is it? <laughs> uh, yeah. And there's like a feeling of like, what do these people who've been rallying and like terrorizing the Warner Brothers social media? What are they expecting? And like the whole joke is like they think it's going to be like. Citizen Kane 2 or something like that and they're going to be sorely disappointed when the movie comes out and it's just a longer version of the uh of the 2017 movie what we already had yeah <laughs> a four hour it, dump instead of a two and a half hour one <laughs> it is amazing how vindicated the like the clamoring fans are now I hope I, I haven't gone out of my way to like read too many opinion pieces but from my point of view as someone who was on the sidelines and not super interested but like morbidly curious as you said i think it was uh, sup- a surprising success like i think this this cut is actually i think the the consensus is it's a lot better than the original cut but yeah. like i wasn't expecting to enjoy it this much especially because yeah. my biggest grievance was it's four hours that's just too much movie for me to movie but i yeah i had a good time with it so i mean yeah the the, the short version is like it's it's better than the 2017 thing and i have to i have to put my hands up and say it's it's a much better film and it's actually like watchable and i've sat and watched it twice now and like the the main thing for me is i just can't get my head around how a lot of that footage already existed and they just put it to the wayside in favor of what they released that's the thing because uh warner brothers i can't remember which ceo was at the time but um, there was a mandate, especially after the Snyders had left, that the movie needs to come in under two hours as well. Yeah. Which feels mm. weirdly arbitrary since most uh, big comic book movies uh, range between the two hour, 20 minute and the two hour, 30 minute line anyway. So it felt a, a weird thing, a weird thing to do to sort of hamstring themselves further on a production which had so many issues. Yeah, so I think those of us who um, had been asking for the Snyder Cut were, like, vindicated, I guess. And those of us who were on the sidelines, like, I guess us three, um, we were kind of, like, pleasantly surprised by all of this, I suppose. Because we were, I was expecting, like, some weird hot mess. But actually, it's like a super coherent superhero film. <laughs> and, and this is the thing, for the last couple of weeks, we've been, like scaring each other up, getting yeah. getting a hype for it, because it was almost like you're gonna watch the train wreck. Yeah. And then um uh, and mm. there's so many things set up for that one, like the length, yeah. um, the um all the sort of trailers in black and white. 
Um, and then the fact that it was um, it's presented in academy ratio, so it looks closer to <laughs> a square frame, which is like fine for me because I love my movies like The Lighthouse and Eda. But it it felt like a weird thing to do considering this movie is made to go out on a streaming service. Yeah. So it's like no one can watch it in an IMAX theater. It wasn't shot in IMAX. It just felt like a weirdly like like a bombastic uh, or pompous choice almost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah did it just because he could yeah it's funny because like the the rhetoric leading up for like the last three or four years has been that like release the snyder cut because he's the original auteur the original visionary of this story and like that there was a sense of that being laughable but they were kind of right like i I mean a lot of it does fall on to the studio making like you said all these different mandates and expecting it to be cut down to two hours and expecting a bit more humor and lightening the tone um relative you know to what uh, the Avengers success was but if like from our limited point of view if Zack Snyder did get to like declare what he wanted from this cut and from the tone that he was going for and like how much of how much of the control he had over it like the fans were right like the Snyder cut was real and it existed in his head and he's brought it out and that's kind of amazing yeah it is, yeah, it really is, is. amazing like the the force majeure or whatever of like these, the, this this huge force of of fans asking for it and whatever, and then it becoming a thing because of that. They spoke um, it into existence. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it also it comes in the wake of other sort of like um, 2016, 2017, 2018 sort of uh, toxic reactions to movies. Like we had the the Last Jedi, and we had you know fans screaming around the 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 content of that film and being, you know, too, too woke or whatever yeah. and demanding changes. And then we got changes in the star Wars, you know, um, rise of Skywalker and like, nobody was satisfied. And like, I think that kind of stuff, uh, maybe set our expectations of what's to come from anything where studios are reacting to the fans. But in this case, it's sort of, yeah, it was a yeah. success. You see, this is why, like, I mean, Leon explains it best because there there was a wide spectrum of people involved in in asking for this and whatever else. But yeah, yeah. this is why I instantly go to the toxic fan explanation because they are the ones that shout the loudest, <laughs> and, and they're the ones you always to... hear about. You know, it's mm. like yeah, and it's horrible. But hey, what can you do? They're here and they're not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think there's. I think, uh, like, separate from the film, I think there's a lot of complicated considerations. And yeah. some of those complicated mm. considerations aren't that complicated. But the way in which um, they intersect and interact with everybody else, it's... Um, there's just... A, a, like, a, like I said before, there's just a wide spectrum. And I think that the, uh, there's things that we need to interrogate with elements of this stuff. Um, mm. um, and like really there should be sort of no need for this because ultimately if we're going back like if if um warner brothers didn't try to push him out and then if there wasn't family tragedy the slider cut wouldn't have been this anyway because they would never have released a four-hour movie that's a flex mm. on hbo max it would have been like a maybe three-hour movie um and it would have been fine because uh and it, it probably would have been what we got, just snappier and less people singing for five minutes. But um, <laughs> like uh, overall, like I, that could have been a good scenario. Yeah. So, it, it, like, if anything, um, Warner Brothers should have delayed for a year. But, but I mean, is this like w- would it be what it is now? Because it's like four years. And at the beginning, it was very much a joke because it very much seemed like the fans who are asking for it didn't really understand how movies work. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's all been shot, ready to go. All you've got to do is press a button and, and uh, uh, the Snyder Cut will be out. And it's like, mm-hmm. no, it's like like massive amounts of like... Um, literally has to cut the film. <laughs> yeah, like, well, it's like post, loads, loads of uh, post-production, like yeah. the company will need to spend uh, tens of millions. Like, it just, it's not a thing that happens, especially for... Um, like they've cut, they had cut the um, branches on that part because they're like, okay, we're doing sort of standalone movies now. So there's there's no incentive from from Warner Brothers to um, 
spend like dozens of millions mm. to um to do this so it that's why it was initially like a, uh like a, a super joke but what we didn't count on is uh AT&T um taking control and um f- uh, f- looking towards a streaming future yeah. and have, writing writing blank checks to get people on their service uh yeah. we just it didn't count for that at all and even having Snyder in 2018 post a picture on Vera or whatever of all the, the canisters. It's like every movie has like a work print, which is like four, five, six hours long. Uh, it's just the daily is all shot together and like edited in like the lock to fit the script. But um, so to like randos, it would be like, yeah, yeah, see, it's ready to go. You could put that in a, in a projector right now and it would play the Snyder <laughs> kind. It's like, that's not how it works. But now we're on the other side of it where because of the streaming millions and, and all that, like this stuff just doesn't happen because it's like these these movies, this movie was made to like launch into other movies. It's part of a whole plan, which is bigger disincentive for uh, a company to pursue it. But the fact that they did, it's just, it's wild. Like you never see this stuff. And that's why it's, uh, it, it's uh, quite mind bending. Real questions time. Which timeline are we in? Are we in the nightmare or or are we in the timeline where everything seems to have gone okay? Is the Snyder Cut the unity or (laughs) is the Snyder Cut the anti-life equation or is the Snyder Cut resurrected Superman? (laughs) I think that it's... uh too early to tell because it could very much be anti-life <laughs> i think it's too early to tell what do you think i think Ray? like we're definitely living in a nightmare greg it's just we got a good <laughs> film out of it like it's, it's not that complicated <laughs> and, that, yeah. and that's the thing like i haven't really shared my comments uh on how i felt about the film but yeah like like you guys i was like pleasantly surprised because i i went into this not uh, not going into it be like uh, to it's uh, specifically be like yeah i'm gonna ha- I hate watch this because it's not really a thing mm-hmm. i generally do and i watch this uh completely sober um but it was just the thing of like this is gonna be ridiculous and i'm here for it and i just wasn't surprised at how much uh it worked for me um like the the common refrain uh refrain i've had talking to people like recommending it to them is that um it's not suddenly the dark knight or something it's not suddenly like mm the best in genre or something. Um, it isn't It isn't the, the Citizen Kane 2 that I think a lot of people thought it was. I think for some people it will be, but it, at the end of the day, it, it's still a silly Snyder, like, comic book adaptation. But it's my favourite of the three that he's done. And it's due to, like, a, a couple of things, but the main thing for me is... There's actually like heart and hope in this movie, which is mm. lacking from his previous movies. And I know that that is a point um, because it's like trying to restore hope. But like even in this movie, which in the theatrical version did feel like a cheat, where suddenly it's like, um, oh, everybody misses Superman because Superman was a hero saving people. It's like that didn't really happen. We got like a montage in Batman vs Superman, but and Man of Steel, he's sort of helping Metropolis <laughs> but become become rubble. So it, you, you didn't really get that sense um, of like there'd be this mass mourning because really another alien appeared when other aliens were here, helped, uh, helped defeated them, but helped destroy the city in the process. And then he, he saved a people, a couple people on roofs and in Mexico and stuff and tankers and exploding rockets and that that was it's kind of it like you didn't really do much at the capitol building when all, all that stuff happened and then uh, a monster appears out of the ship which is related to him in that they left in the middle of town still and it laid waste to loads of stuff and uh he died taking it out like that's not really a thing of like set up enough for it to be like Earth has lost its hero and everybody's like mega mourning in that way. Like it is a cheat, but I think what this version does is it still has that cheat to a degree, but I think it sells it better in terms mm. of, uh, especially through the, um, the, the motions of people like uh, Bruce Wayne, who yeah. 
is just way better in this movie uh, than he was in the previous cut, but also in the previous movie where he was just like, he was very one note. And obviously he's inspired by um, Miller's Snyder's book. like favorite, um, favorite comic book from his favorite uh, author and artist. But um, it's like, that felt like um, visuals only thing mm. where it's like, it's a cool influence, but there's, he didn't really bring over what made Miller's Batman tick because it was kind of a cheap, like that, that book works because there's like decades of history of Batman before. Yeah. And obviously there's decades of history of Batman before in films, but in this series, it feels weird to introduce a bunch of heroes, but then have one of the heroes like, at the end of their, their, their yeah, career. Here's Batman, but he's already old. <laughs> yeah. And you've missed yeah. all the cool stories already. That's, that's um, that was my one issue with, Batman versus that was one of my issues with Batman versus Superman. If I because I'm an I'm a BVS apologist, I'm not going to lie, but <laughs> that is one of my issues with it. Mm. And like I think what this movie does is that while it doesn't erase the issues I have with Man of Steel and Batman versus Superman, I think it gives them better. Um, I think the next stages of them are fulfilled better, and so I think that. The Batman stuff works because um, he generally feels like regretful and not just regretful for the storyline. Like, um, and he generally feels more hopeful. And um, there's like nice threads going through this movie um, of like connection, like family, and uh, not not uh, not being broken and. Just a, a lot of things of like lost people kind of finding each other. And I think I put it in one of our group chats, it's like orphans finding orphans. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that plays through the film like really well. And like, so what usually when I go into like a Snyder movie, even like BVS, Man of Steel and stuff. And like uh, for listeners who don't know, like I enjoyed Man of Steel, but I didn't like its representation of Superman, like divorce of that and not caring anymore. It's fun, but I think that it just gets lost in its third act. But it's fine. It's a it's a three out of five. Yeah. Uh, and B- BVS, I've got I've got way more issues with, um, <laughs> like um, from a like representation of characters is even worse than Man of Steel, and like hurts me because it's Batman this time, uh, who's 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 getting this treatment. And before anybody gets to, to Twitter, Twitter fingers, like it's not just for the killing stuff. I think you can do the killing stuff fine. I just wish it was sold better. And it wasn't just like this. This is going to look cool. Yeah. But even divorced of that, because obviously th- that movie is uh, from 2016. I've made my piece of that, and I'm just re- watching it like an Elseworlds thing. There's still structural things that I hate about it. I hate all the stuff of Doomsday, and there's a lot of just silly things. Everybody's spoken about Martha and blah blah blah. There's a lot of things I just don't like in there. But there are obviously moments of genius because, like, I, like how I began this whole spiel. If Snyder's good at one thing, it's composing an image. It's uh, giving us, like, moving frescoes. It's, um, like, being inspired by his favourite comic book panels and then bringing them to life visually. Like, And he's very good at that. Yeah. He is very good at that. Very and we've good. seen it across, across his movies, even before Watchmen. Like, he is, um, he's very good at doing that. And that's what I was expecting going into this. I thought, we're going to get some cool action and um, we're going to get some really cool imagery. But I really feel, think, like beyond that because obviously he delivers on all of that stuff and more but like i wasn't expecting there to be like heart and levity it's weird because warner brothers whole thing was like let's bring in jokes and stuff and let's make it light and but like they went in a very like cheesy like lame joke type thing which is like mm. it felt even more uh in Congo because um these characters just didn't act like this, like uh, like I don't know, two weeks before, which was when the previous movie set. Like mm-hmm. it just, it just felt weird. Like Batman, yeah, it was dissonant, like, wasn't it? Yeah, like the wacky meeting. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. it was ridiculous. Whereas in this, there is still like humor. Obviously, it's still a Zack Snyder movie, so people aren't just popping off quips and stuff. But it all feels more like layered in character. And there's just so many elements in, in this where I'm just like, oh wow, this is really cool, and like. Oh, I, I, I'm surprised this is this is him who's doing this. And like the biggest stuff of that is the biggest tragedy of the the theatrical cut, which is Cyborg. 
Yeah. Where like Cyborg is the backbone of this story. He's the center of it. The mm. the titles come up when he's first on screen. And I was like, whoa, okay. And his, um, his whole existence is central to the narrative of that film. Yeah. And I, I think they they do a lot. Because I mean, part of the reason this movie's so long is because they have to, to give us intro intro stories to the characters they hadn't that we haven't seen before. Um and but like I think that the cyborg stuff is handled like really well. And mm. It, it, it wouldn't be where I'd point towards like bloat, um, because that stuff I think like the relationship between Victor and his and his father, um, and then all the things of like like without saying it, the great power, great responsibility thing. I think that's rendered visually in um, a really cool sequence, and um, I know it, it made that character when when they announced because this is back when uh, Warner Brothers were feeling themselves before they released. Um, I think it was before they released Batman vs Superman, or maybe during. But when they were feeling themselves and they were announcing all these dates, and one of them was like a cyborg movie, twenty twenty or twenty twenty one, and it felt ridiculous at the time because it was like what, you haven't set up this character at all, and you're already like saying yeah in four years time or five years time we're going to drop the cyborg movie and it's going to make a billy. And um, what's nuts is that it's 2021 now, and we did kind of get the cyborg movie, and and it and it does work. And like I think this character could have branched out and like got their own uh, like film, or like I know we could have got a Teen Titan thing or so or anything. But like there's a cool, there's a lot of potential in this character that was really squandered uh, in the 2017 um, release, and now we know all the stuff that happening was happening like during those reshoots and like uh, backstage it kind of a lot of things a lot of dots are starting to connect in terms of which characters uh, suffered the most and uh yeah it's, it's all like gross and like awful but i mean on on this side of it it's it's nice to see that stuff restored and getting a bit of like um more of a, a sort of whole vision of a lot of these characters because like like Aquaman, uh, Wonder Woman. I, I feel like I feel like they are like in in the 2017. They they're given lots of like actiony stuff to do, but I think in this movie, it really is a live action motion comic, um, hmm. and, and I think the square pat the square frame does aid that feeling. But it really does feel like you're watching. You're going from panel to panel. Or, or you're looking at splash pages at times, yeah. because like the the, the framing, uh, the sequences of shots, the sort of uh, I know the build up of action uh, and the way how how different um, like shots are staged, all of it feels very much uh, like that, like um, Snyder's digging in his Watchmen bag, and uh, it all all works to. Uh, for me to 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 great effect like um yeah i was pleasantly pleasantly surprised by this movie i wasn't expecting to leave it thinking like yeah this is the uh the best one the best of these that he's done and yeah man if if dc did restore <laughs> the snyderverse uh, i would be i would be like cautiously interested mm. but not in a thing of where i'm suddenly going to be like the biggest snyder dc head like i'm already a snyder a reformed snyder apologist <laughs> so like um like i'm not i don't need to go back there because i know exactly how i kind of feel with all of these these movies and how they work but it is i think what they what what he was doing was really interesting and like stuff that he said since about where he was going to take the story maybe it's lucky we're not continuing because some of it sounds awful but i viewed this whole dceu or the snyderverse as like this weird offshoot thing where i now no longer have need to worry about how each character is portrayed and instead it's just a thing where they they put millions on the screen so that um this this guy's vision <laughs> of like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna write my own fan comic now we get yeah. it on the big screen and yeah it's like o- overall i i quite enjoyed it yeah so pop culture curio that we can yeah. go back to time and time again and enjoy and i think you've pretty much covered like everything that i was going to say about it anyway uh, with it being the most comic booky comic book movie of all time, like even to the fact that it's broken up into acts, which makes it feel like watching a six-part event movie event. Yeah, legit. Or something. Yeah, 
and that's the mm. thing as well where when you mentioned that and you put a link of all the all the stuff i thought like what like this is because there was a time where it was rumored he was either going to do it be a tv miniseries or a movie and in the end it just said movie but it's like this could have been a tv movie series it could have yeah so it does it does feel it it does make it felt like another stage of the thing we were talking about with the the framing um yeah. sorry the uh the aspect ratio where it's like it just felt like a visionary director like uh like flex for no reason mm. but it actually so, works yeah so um ray you got anything to add to that <laughs> <laughs> what can I say that hasn't already been said? Yeah, exactly. Um, Leon said it all. <laughs> Leon's like perfected the the opinion there. He has. I think like um, I, I think the thing that surprised me was I, I was expecting for them to take every opportunity to write a plot by committee. Like they had years to see what everybody's opinion was, what all the what all the people wanted, and then deliver just on what the people wanted. And I was shocked to find that they didn't just resort to that. They didn't just take the content that was already there and um, take away all the humor and make it all doubt. Like, I was expecting it to be a complete tonal flip um, and not this re-evaluation of the, the, the themes that were there and, like, make it additive. I really wasn't expecting them to add all this heart and add all this, you know, as Leon was saying, like, orphans finding orphans and having that be a theme that connects throughout the entire film. and like. Yeah, I guess I can't help but be impressed by mm. the level of care that's gone into it. Because I think, and and maybe that's a um, a judgment on my part that I shouldn't be that I should be ashamed of. Maybe to like assume that it would be the the you know the the most pandering or the most um, like meddled with version. And there was actually a lot of craft and artistry and you know uh, love put into this. So yeah. Definitely. And um, I was pleasantly surprised by what we got and surprised enough to pleasantly surprised enough to enjoy it and watch it twice. So there we go. And uh, yeah. So there we go. This this is like, I guess that's like the biggest thing that happened, wasn't it? Over <laughs> the last week. <laughs> I mean, we had the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, but we've only got 40 minutes of that. And while it's good and I enjoyed it, I'm like, I need more of it to form an opinion. I feel yeah. I don't, I don't have anything strong enough to say on that right now. Well, this is like if you had to do a review on one division after watching episode one. Yeah, exactly. You can't, but it's about <laughs> without like, the, like, it's like doing a review of one division episode one, but without there being a gimmick that you can even latch yeah, on to yeah. and talk about. Yeah. 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 So uh, I guess I'll move on to the other things I've been doing. So I bought an Eternals omnibus. Um, so I've been dipping into Kirby's Eternals and just feeling all that weird Jack Kirby imagination just wash over me. And it's amazing. I love it. Um, so other than that, I've been, I started rereading Sandman. So mm. I went back to the beginning of the, um, the Game and Sandman comics because I, I got the bug because of this lock and key Sandman crossover that's come in, Helen Gone. And Helen Gone Zero, which is like the kind of like prep material, if you like, for the crossover, has been, it, it is out and has been out for a while. And um, I had my copy just sort of like sitting on my to read stack because I knew, I knew that it was like material that had already been printed and I knew that I had already read what was in it, but I went and read it anyway and flicked through it. And it's like, it collects material from Sandman and from uh like it um open the moon which is the lock and key story which is the one that always makes me kind of like a little bit sad cry a little bit um it's the one where the sickly child is taken to the moon um and uh like they kind of just like it's like they take him to the afterlife in a gentle way using the keys and um, he goes up to the moon in the balloon and they, you know, unlock the moon and he goes backstage on the world and they leave him there. And it's a cute, really heartfelt story. Like, I love it. Like, and I love the, this kind of like um, turn of the century 
aesthetic going on that they have in the comic and everything else, which is something we're going to be bumping on later as well because of some of the stuff we've got to talk about this episode. But like how it goes into that and how it how it does that and, and plays with that kind of like um it's all stuff that feeds back to uh like aping the little Nemo in Slumberland thing because this book does it as well. So I was reading that and then I read the Sandman material that's also collected in there and I was like, and I've got to reread Sandman. So I fell into this, I fell into the trap <laughs> and I'm now working my way back through Sandman in my hype for Helen Gone. So Helen Gone Zero is out and about if you want to get that. That's like the prep material, like the two things that kind of like will prep you for the ideas and things that they play with in, supposedly play with in the Helen Gone comic, which is like the hell key from um the sandman uh universe and um it's yeah it's gonna it's gonna be uh it's gonna be very interesting and that's coming april 14th i believe we get the issue one of helen gone so we get like the event proper april 14th which would be cool so yeah i think the whole premise is that um john jack Locke has been dead for 10 years um, and he's been posting the occasional letter home from hell. And now Mary Locke will do anything to save her brother's soul, including cut a deal with Roderick Burgess, the most evil man in England, who is the guy that appears at the beginning of the Sandman books, who is kind of a um, pastiche of Alistair Crowley, I think. I think that's the idea. Um, and um, yeah, uh, the house of mystery, all of that stuff kind of just like fits in together. So it all kind of just feeds in. And that's where I've been for the past few weeks anyway, because I've got mm. that big old house of mystery omnibus as well. So it's just like <laughs> this, I'm I'm in there. I'm, I'm in the middle of it already. So I'll be ready to talk about that when it comes out. Um, that's cool. Yeah. So on top of that, we've got, um, Man Bat that I've continued to read, which is really cool. Man Bat solo series from DC. Um, another quick, quick thing that I wanted to mention that I picked up and read was Two Moons, because this is something that I was excited for at the end of last year. It was an image comic. So um, if I just give you the quick lowdown on Two Moons before we... So uh, this is um, a horror story centered around a young man named Virgil Morris, who is a uh he's um pawnee nation uh and he's fighting for the union during the civil war in america um so it's set during the american civil war and um he is suddenly confronted with his shamanic roots as it puts here in the uh, blurb he discovers horrors far worse than combat as the ghosts of his past reveal the monstrous evil around him and uh it does things that i am used to only seeing in vietnam stories so it's like a gorgeous book filled with like historical horrors of the American Civil War and the horrors that men exact upon each other and the hidden horrors of how the violence changes people. So it goes through themes of like PTSD and blood drunkenness and using the supernatural elements to illustrate that in the story. And um, yeah, this is stuff that I'm usually only seeing in Vietnam stories. And it's also like a tool to show how they use the supernatural stuff as a tool to show how Virgil is at odds with his Pawnee nation heritage. And it's an excellent read and I can't wait for issue two. And I, f I think you two should pick this up so we can have a, a, a deeper convo about it because it's really cool. Yes. Yeah, sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, and that brings us on to the first book this week. Uh, the first of the reviews. So, um, we all read. Bzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
He's half mortal and half god, cursed and compelled to violence, even at the sacrifice of his sanity. But after wandering the world for centuries, B may have finally found a refuge, working for the US government to fight the battles too violent and too dangerous for anyone else. In exchange, B will be granted the one thing he desires, the truth about his endless blood-soaked existence and how to end it. So Keanu Reeves made a comic, but berserker. So like, I mean, where does, where to start with this? It's you the start at the issue. top and say that the first page has Sam Keanu <laughs> sat on a bench. Like, that's yeah. where you start. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's self aware. It is because <laughs> yeah, the pa- the first page is literally like. Um, at this point in time, is Keanu Reeves his characters, or is Keanu Reeves Keanu Reeves? Like when we see, when we look at Keanu Reeves in real life now, are we just looking at John Wick? Like at, at this point in time, is there any Keanu Reeves left, or is Keanu just the culmination of all these characters he's portrayed in films? Like, is the latter? Yeah, I mean, did I... is is Keanu Reeves a tulpa? Did they write him into existence by <laughs> writing these parts for him in films and thus created him? Possibly. <laughs> I think. I think that the the um, maybe the um, the truest Keanu Reeves is the. Um... The Keanu Reeves we met along the way? Yes. <laughs> or, or or maybe, like, there's never been a true Keanu Reeves. I think the real Keanu Reeves <laughs> is Johnny Utah. <laughs> you would. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, it's the premiere issue of a 12-issue limited series. Um, and uh, it's, like, straight away, brutal bone-cracking fist to the ribs. And we're thrown screaming into the red world of B. Um, it's like blood, violence, and nothing more. So this book, for me, like the easiest way for me to describe it to anyone who's possibly thinking about reading it is John Wick meets the old guard by way of Wolverine. So it's got a lot of classic Wolverine in it, a lot of Weapon x stuff going down in these pages, like Claremont Miller Wolverine vibes, Windsor Smith Weapon X vibes. Um, like... I mean, what do you guys get from it? So, um, if I throw to Leon first on this one, what do you think? Yeah, it's it's wild because, like, f- first reading it, I thought, um, yeah, it's cool because the, the setup panels, like, sad Keanu on the bench, the blue, uh, going into the like color, it was all like, okay, this is cool. I, I was I was thinking what you were saying. And before we'd seen any violence, and that was uh, definitely um, John Wick, um, like Wolverine, like Weapon X. And then it became more old guard as he got to the ground. But yeah, I thought, okay, this is cool. But it, it felt almost a bit pat, like at the beginning, like almost, not generic, but it's like, I wonder what the wrinkle here is because it is cool and hyper violent and. But I was thinking, like, what is the, what's the flip here? Because we've, I feel like at this point we've seen so many like people's heads get punched open and stuff like that. I was thinking, like, what's the, uh, what's the flip? What's the twist? And I, I was enjoying, uh, like, the action. But I was like, okay, we're just in some like South American country. Uh, all these like people, these uh, fodders. Like, what's the story here? It all feels very like generic just with like savage brutal action and then towards the end of the first issue um actually no during the issue we're having this conversation and then towards the end of the issue which i won't say exactly what it is um things the the wrinkle becomes more interesting and there's a um not just backstory but the um the main conflict of the character uh, like it sets up the world stakes and sort of wants and, and desires and I did enjoy it more towards the end. Um which it was it sounds like I wasn't enjoying it the whole time. But it, it more so it grounded it to be more like, yeah it's cool, I'll I'll read this book of this guy just massacring these guys in like cool fashion. But like I think that the end stuff does add more texture and um interest me more into where this is going, rather if it had just been uh old guard 
a Weapon X John Wick just mowing down people and being cool, it kind of would have felt a bit flat to me because it's like, oh, he's just doing this comic so that he can option it as a movie to shoot in a few years' time, uh, which is probably the case. But um, <laughs> with with the stuff towards the end, I can see where... Um, like, it's a bit more like myth-making and stuff, and it feels like, oh, okay, there's a story they hear that that they did want to tell um, in comic book form, and then it sort of, like, slightly reevaluates the earlier stuff, which uh, is still kind of, like, two-dimensional, but um, it is... It, it gives it extra, like, grounding and extra weight, which works more for me. Mm. Um, Ray, what did you make of this one? Yeah, I think, like, echoing what Leon said, I sort of felt the same thing. Like, is this just an excuse for Keanu Reeves to <laughs> fulfill one of his life's ambitions and, you know, make a comic book that he or, could ultimately make into a movie? Or, right? or, or, or is it a way for him to feed himself with our <laughs> mind energy and keep himself sustained and alive as another character? Yeah, it's just another one of his um, living paintings to for him to be yeah. immortal inside. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I initially had that thought as well. And I think, like Leon was saying, like I enjoyed all the violence and I enjoyed the artistry on the page, but I was wondering what the wrinkle was going to be, what the twist was going to be. And like Leon, I was surprised by where it goes and I'm interested in it. But as I was reading it, I was thinking, is it is it just another... Uh, that sounds a bit slight. Is it another John Wick where... Keanu Reeves is optioned in this story where it's an affordance for virtuoso. Like John Wick is a simple film in, in regards to its plot. And like, if you stripped it down to its barest, it's not, it's nothing um, like unique or uh, what's the word? It's not original in that sense, but what it is, is a simple plot driven by a simple goal and allows for, like a a really good sense of like craft and this whole team of people coming together to make something that is spectacularly well put together, really well made. And I feel like this book is kind of the same thing. Like it's not an amateur undertaking of a simple plot. Like all of the, the moment to moment stuff felt really good. Like, um, I don't know. It felt, it felt like to me, like action cinema, like there's a flow of moments. There's a clarity of movement through a space where every, punctuation is like a violent intent and like i wonder how long it's going to sustain this over 12 issues it feels like a lot to just pack with you know action cinema moments but i'm keen to see where it goes and i like i like the questions it asks us to make about the main character as it goes along and it culminates in this really interesting place where it makes you wonder where it's going to go next because he's not just another wolverine type i mean it has shades of weapon x like you said but you know, it's a guy who chooses to be this, and there's a reason for that. And mm. yeah, I'm I'm curious to see what's going to come of this. If if only, be, I normally I feel like this is something I'd be curious about, but maybe drop off a few issues. But the fact that it's you know written by or partially written by Keanu Reeves is you know makes me interested to see what he's going to bring to the table. So put some, put some weight behind it. Yeah. Hmm. Um. I mean, it has fantastic pacing and really visceral art. Like the violence is totally off the scale the book is completely relentless it's like action on action on action like each panel finds a new way to surprise you with movement and kinetic energy it's like Mm. has these like really cool Mm. does this really cool thing with tilted panels that give you like speed and impact and blood soaks beat after beat like and you're like going through this berserker rampage and it's like showcasing all this unrelenting fury of our main character all the while it's like punctuated by this conversation that leon mentioned which is like between a doctor and the berserker himself and he's like he's a man of few words as you know which is what gave me the real john wick vibes it's like the one word answers kind of thing um and he's like seeking to understand himself and eventually we're given a break from all these hot reds and fiery fiery oranges for like these cool calm greens and blues in these lab scenes which is where i get the weapon x stuff from like a perfect killing machine dissected and studied or whatever, like harnessed, but to what end? And like, it's this idea again of the immortal hero, but presented in a very different way. Like the old guard wanted to be left alone to use their gift to do what was right. Logan was a wolf. Logan Wolverine. He was a man at odds with his own nature and he becomes a beast. And B wants to understand himself and his place in the world. He seeks the why, the how and the end. And like, 
yeah, that's that's like for me, it's just like another facet of that immortal warrior thing, like another way of exploring that kind of character. Um, and like the injury detail and the impact and the sheer scale of it, and it's just like one long bloody howl at the moon. And I mean, it's interesting, and I'm invested. I'm entertained. It's an action blockbuster comic. Now, where's my graphic novel adaptation of Point Break? <laughs> <laughs> Because that's what I really want. <laughs> that's what this has all really been about. I'm just chasing the dragon, just looking, for, <laughs> just looking for more Point Break. But no, yeah, that was um, so. That's Berserker. Um, I has anyone else got anything more to say about Berserker? I would just echo what you guys have said. Like the the art is really really cool, and the the uh, action pacing is very cinematic um, and very. Uh, well rendered like you really do feel especially in the chase bit and at the, the start you really do feel the uh the inertia you feel the forces of of mm. like wind as you're zooming around you feel the heat of explosions uh it it is all very um elemental in some ways and and mm. tactile and others so yes, Berserker number one available on shelves now. Um, and that is, uh, yeah, Boom Studios. So uh, check that out. Um, the next one on our list is a- another book you can feel. <laughs> um, and like, this is something that's been popping up on my feeds and towering over the tweets of others. Like it's a new book from Image and Skybound. It's, um, so it's called Ultra Mega. And the first thing that comes into my head when anyone says Ultra Mega is Ultra Mega OK by Soundgarden, um, the album. But like, so this is like, again, like this is in, in it's it's kind of like Berserker in it being like action packed and everything else. But it's, it's, it's in a different way. This is like a graphic gut punch, like straight away. You've got these bright colors and this bold logo design and this it's big and intense, just just like what's in the pages of this book. So this first issue is like 61 pages long. So it gives you a little more than your standard single issue. And I truly do love it for that because as an issue one, I I think following this template, all issue one should be double length. Um, And so the blurb for this one, a cosmic plague has spread, transforming everyday people into violent, monstrous kaiju. Only the Ultra Mega, three individuals imbued with incredible powers, hold the line against this madness. Their their battles level cities and leave untold horror in their wake. Now the final reckoning approaches for the Ultra Mega. But this is a war they can even... But is this a war they can even win? So, yeah, and this is... um, So... Kind of like this is like a riff on the um, the giant monster movie Ultraman versus Monster of the Week type thing, I guess. Um, and this is uh, the, uh, the the artist, the writer, and the creator of this whole thing is uh, a one James Harron. Colors are by Dave Stewart. Um, letters by Russ Wooten, and uh, it is published by Image Comics. Um, you read this as well, didn't you, Leon? I did, I did. Um, so yeah, like, gives you a little more than your standard issue one, which I think you would have been, you would have liked that, right? Oh, yeah, I did. Like, <laughs> I, I was reading it, so um, I was reading this, like, a comicsology, and I didn't click in to see how big it was. So um, I'm, like, sweeping, sweeping through pages, and I was thinking, like, man, it's like, a lot has happened in this book so far. And then I got to the end and I was like, oh, it was a double. But like, I felt like it was just giving me like, because it's, it, it's a big setup. Like this first issue is almost like the um, the prologue. Yeah. Um, where like it, it's basically giving the backstory, building the world and giving um, us, the reader, an idea of what this comic's going mm. to be. Uh, going forward and i remember thinking like wow they've devoted a lot to this setup and then uh realizing that i was reading like a double issue and it felt great to be honest i i wish uh most number ones were longer than what they what they were um because yeah this it, it, it felt like 
Instead of having that little that little snap, and then I have to wait a month, it felt like I had the meal and I was, was happy a to wait a month. meal. It was. Yeah. And, and um, I don't know, continue. Yeah, I was going to say issue two is going to be oversized as well because that clocks in at 44 pages according to what Sean Makovic has uh, written at the back of this one. Living. So, yeah. Um, so, like, it, I, I, I absolutely love this. Like, so James Harron, he, he's, there's this little blurb at the back of the comic that kind of explains his creative vision. And James, James Harron tells us at the back of this issue that he didn't want to be bound by the constraints of 20 page chapters. He wanted to stretch out and explore his manga sensibilities. And he talks to us about the golden age of OVA anime and Robocop and Evil Dead and, and like Devil Man. And like, how can I can see all of this already in this like this this heady experimental graphic stew that is this sixty one page comic that he's given us? Like, I knew it was going to be fat going into it when I saw the price on Comicsology, but damn, is it worth every penny? Like, you can see homages in this to things like Avon Galleon, like in the design and the art, and like you can see the influence of Devil Man in the body horror that's like ever present in these pages because it is basically ultraman um body horror by way of ultraman is probably one of the best ways i can describe it and it gets and he he like he james harron also talks about like oh you know i wanted to make something where like with these like this the golden age of ovi anime and whatever these people were, were getting experimental and they were like swinging for the fences or whatever like nerds swinging for the fences i think are the exact words he uses but like I think he swung for the fences and I think he hit them and I think maybe he went through them. And then I think he went through the sound barrier. And then I think he went onto the glass <laughs> sphere at the edge of the universe because <laughs> this goes places like, and the art is like really something else as well. And you can see the manga influence there. Like you can see it, like it, it bleeds that tightness and detail that you associate with manga and the energy and the movement and these large kinetic set pieces, like less words, more movement, like more action, like hard speed and impact. And you feel the G's in each panel and like the force in each punch. Um, like, I mean, for you, Leon, I like, I know that you have the same kind of affinity for like the golden age of OVA anime as I do. So like, did you, did you get all of this from it? I did because, like that, that era is when we like came of age, and it's when you could grab VHSs, and it'd be like an OVA, which and sometimes just felt like two, two or three episode lengths of a of an anime, and it was always they were like animated video nasties to a degree, where they <laughs> yeah, get censored much. and stuff, <laughs> and a lot of the time the dub is like overdone where like they're just adding adding swear words where they probably weren't there <laughs> before and everything's like everything's like hyper crunchy and and violent and um that there, there was always like just so much boobs in in yeah. in, the, in those books but like it was it's a very much like an era of i don't know it's an era when things they because they because they weren't made for TV. Uh, you did have that cool sort of like I don't know that um, subversive edge where it's like you're watching uh, off the dark tunes type thing. And I think like years later, people like MTV would harness harness that really well in mm. in in, the, in their things like Aeon Flux and the Max and stuff. But like. Um, yeah, like this is a, has a lot of things that uh, it's influenced by a lot of things that that I really like, and uh, like reading it, I, I was very um, like I think not only does it mix the the kaiju element and sort of the zentai element uh, quite well, but I think one of my favorite parts is there's it feels like there's a very big Giver influence and. The 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 Giver, uh, the original twelve episode series from the nineties. That was yeah. my jam because it was um, it's super gnarly body horror stuff, and yeah. it's um, it's like hyper destructive in that way. Where like 
like this because uh, the main character uh, show uh, he also is implanted with like um, an alien thing, and it, and it gives him the ability to change it into like a bio mech suit, which he can then use to like fight monsters. And um, wh- one of the things that I really liked in that is how destructive it was on him, because when he would turn to Guy, that it would like these scabs on his back would like mutate, and it would like send out an energy beam that would destroy stuff. So. Uh, you'd have situations where he would be handcuffed to people that he loved and he couldn't change to the guy for that moment. Um, so, like, it always added that wrinkle and also, like, changing to guy who would heal him. So there's times where his arm, his limbs are getting ripped off uh, and you're, and it's, like, stuff like that is always, like, terrifying when, when like, the, the hero loses body parts type thing. And I know it's part of the camp. Campbell journey or whatever, but like when it's actually like people getting their like arms ripped off and stuff, you're like whoa! Especially when, <laughs> uh, how how old I was in in the in the nineties. But like um, the thing I really loved about that, it was so just graphic and gruesome. But not just like because it's cool to watch heads explode, but also because I don't know, it felt like it was real, real big stakes. So when we hit the noughties and there was a new guy of a series, which was twenty four episodes. I remember watching that and it felt so toothless. Yeah, it so was. Like, it really was. Yeah, like it just wasn't. It just wasn't the same. Um, so like when we got to, uh, so like I'd always go back. Uh, I'd always go back uh, and and rewatch that series, and all of this like uh, starting blurb is just to say like how much this is like up my up my jam because it it is really destructive and like there's a whole. A lot of this time, it's like a lot of stuff with this trope. It's like some school kid um, who's been given this this great power, but in this, it's a guy who's like his life is like uh, taken taken its turns, and he, he's affected by stuff like uh, unemployment and like medical bills and and things like that. And um, I know that it, it 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 does ground the story a lot more, considering it involves people. Uh, getting massive and turn into like um skyscraper sized um entities to be able to fight other skyscraper sized entities so by having like by building up this character so much and building this world where it like you said it has shades of things like uh Ava and the um it it like the stakes are really high because it has that sort of comedy, that sort of sly comedy era where it's like, man, like I would just not live in this city <laughs> where you yeah. have to have evacuation zones because giant monsters show up. But I mean, what choice do you really have, especially if you don't have a job and stuff? But um, yeah, like as you go through it, uh, it's, it's just more and more building the world um, and building stakes that I, 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 I literally didn't know where it was going uh, after each page. And like you say, in terms of the the manga detail, like there's so many great panels and great pages where like the either the creature design or the design of tentacles or the design of a locale or the like um, the uh, the bags under a character's eyes. Uh, there's so much texture. There's so much um, detail. In in each of it, it really, I don't know. It really does feel like you at times you you are reading like a a, a manga in some ways because it's um, especially like when you have loads of pages where they are really devoid of characters talking to each other, mm. and it's instead it's onomatopoeia and um, just the following the action from panel to panel. It um. It, it yeah it really does feel like the core bravado you'd get in say OVA uh, anime yeah. where um or like a manga that those are based off where it was like incredible concept that you're like how do people think of this but then a really uh, great execution in how uh, the action story and characters uh, unfold and evolve and all of this I was reading thinking like what the hell like this is wild for a first issue. 
this is like I was thinking, did I accidentally buy a trade? Because uh, I didn't even, I didn't really notice the price, and like I yeah. said before, I didn't, I didn't notice the uh, the length while I was reading it. Yeah. So I was thinking, like, did I accidentally like? Is this a trade? Did Greg not say it was a trade? Is, like, is half... this a graphic novel? <laughs> yeah, I got halfway through and I'm like, is this a one shot? <laughs> yeah. I'm going through it because it's like it's setting up all sorts. It has, it, yeah. Um, it like builds up the stakes so well. We find out more about the Ultra Mega, like, and the whole sort of squad, and it builds up like relationship stuff between them and sort of a uneasiness how about about how it's all affecting them in different ways, mm. um, and how because for. Well, like some, it's just like a job where you work really long hours and you're on the clock all the time because at any time um, you might need to defend against uh, a monster. Because essentially, the comic opens up with saying like there's an infection out there, a virus. Uh, and at first, it did almost make me roll my eyes. I was like, oh man, don't be like some uh, <laughs> some uh, COVID uh, <laughs> uh, metaphor, or whatever. But it, it quickly zooms past that yeah. to not be a thing. And, um, yeah, it uses a lot of the cool sort of manga uh, and, like, badass Western comic tropes, but it's it, it adds, a, like, a world weariness to them. Yeah. And it... We, it, it, it uh, no, sorry. I was going to say, we come into it at the Dark Knight Returns point of Ultraman. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, like, uh, I'm not going to spoil, like, what happens at the end, but just to say that, like, how... Like there's action in here, which is like proper like Dragon Ball Z, which which I loved, um, and then for like to find out it's like oh this is the this is basically the prologue they've set up the world here is like oh this is really good, um, so I'm I'm a big fan big fan of this book yeah so this is comics if you know the Snyder Cut. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, no, there's a, there's a single page in this book that I absolutely adore. Um, it's a dead body, but it's a huge dead body and the city around it is all smashed to bits and it's like, it's disemboweled and the head's off and everything. And it's just like the level of detail in the gore. And it it's just immense. absolutely fantastic. Do you know what the it's best thing? Absolutely ab- immense. Yeah. The best thing about reading this book as well, reading this comic is that I've recently just watched that. A Marvel documentary about Japanese Spider Man on Disney Plus. Yeah. So it's like I was reading about like I was watching the documentary about like Sentai stuff, and then I come onto this, and it's like, yeah, what better way to do it? So yeah, giant monster battles. It's a grimier, bloodier, less sanitary version of an Ultraman. <laughs> Very <movie>. bloody. <laughs> yeah. Very <laughs> bloody. <laughs> yeah, so it's like Ultraman by way of body horror, and I love it. I love the kaiju designs, the strangeness of the form, and how everything is like so fleshy, and everything bleeds, and it looks painful, and as it all transforms. And then there's like gruesome biology gives way to mechanical designs in the second half of the book, and like they still carry an organic edge as well, and it's still full mm. of detail. And, and it's, it's like. like- Sorry, some awful like description. Yeah, like, there's a description later on that uh, made me feel a bit ill. <laughs> it was so good, but it made me yeah. feel a bit ill. Yeah, it's like small particles and lots of detail and lots of lines, and it brings to mind like other Western artists who I feel have very manga leanings and influences, like James Stokoe. Um, but yeah, beautiful colours and gritty textures and it's great fun. And uh, speaking of James Stokoe, actually, he's got a new book that's currently out, which um, I just wanted to give it a shout because it's really good. And it's in a similar, it, it's, uh, I, I'm hyped to read it. I'm, I'm waiting because I think this is another one that I'm going to end up with in print. But like, I, you know, I, I've seen previews of it and I know the rough gist of it and it looks absolutely brilliant. It's a Kung Fu story called Orphan and the Five Beasts. Um, and it just looks absolutely insane. And it's that classic James Stokoe, like, art and like what, what you would come to expect from him, like having looking at his previous art, like uh, Aliens Dead Orbit mm. or the, uh, some of the Godzilla comics. Um, yeah, it's just, it's everything you want. It's great. So yeah, I mean, that is Ultra Mega. I'll just give you the credits again. So that's um, created, the the uh, created, written, and uh, the, all the art is by James Harron. Colours by Dame, James uh, Dave Stewart. Letters by Russ Wooten and published by Image Comics. So um, we move on to the last book here today, 
which um, is one that all three of us read, which is a preview book. Um, so we have a beautiful collection of some of the most wonderful comics I've ever laid eyes on. And it's nice that we get sent this stuff. And I really am thankful that our little DIY zine of a podcast even gets like thought about, <laughs> recognized and sent preview stuff. It's great. Like I'm always amazed and astounded when things drop into our inbox. Like even when we're on press lists and things like that, it's nice. It's like, oh, okay. Um, we're, we're getting somewhere. <laughs> People are hearing us. I love it. So yeah, Avery Hill Publishing have sent us a review copy of Alone in Space, which is a collection of works by the extremely talented Tilly Walden. Now, um, Tilly Walden is a cartoonist and illustrator from Austin, Texas. She uh, published three original graphic novels with Avery Hill before going on to create um, a graphic memoir called Spinning, which won an Eisner. Um, after Spinning, she did On a Sunbeam which was originally published as a webcomic and her latest graphic novel, Are You Listening? also won an Eisner for Best Graphic Novel in 2020. Um, she's got a picture book which is due out in 2021 and she, um, yeah, she's currently teaching at the Centre for Cartoon Studies, the CCS, um, in New Hampshire. Um, so yeah, this book uh, is currently available for pre-order through the Avery Hill website, which we will include links in the show notes. And um, it is priced at twenty four ninety nine UK, thirty two ninety five US, and that is out tenth of June twenty twenty one. In the UK, it's sixth uh, of July. Oh, tenth of June in the UK, sixth of July in the US. So, um, this book kind of opens with. Um, the first published comic she did, which was end, the end of summer. Um, and um, it's like these three long form comics, end of summer, I love this part and a city inside, which were all previously published with Avery Hill um, alongside some like never before collected works from earlier in her career, like the early work that kind of brought her into the spotlight and jump started her fame. Um, and, the first thing that hits you about this collection is like the sheer amount of talent and imagination contained within it. Like it, it's like opening a window into another place. Like you literally get lost in it. And before you know it, it's dark outside and you've hit the final page and you just don't want to leave. Like it's, it's just a, just a beautiful, beautiful collection. So, I mean, uh, I'll throw to Ray first. What was your first impressions on this one? This is an intimidating book to review, I think. Um, like, because already there's there's a lot to cover. There's, as you said, three main stories that it encompasses. And then it sort of uh, backpedals and gives us a really vast collection of some of her earlier, like, one or two page comics or, like, you know, very short form things that she did between the ages of 16 and 20. And it's like... You see the the talent on display in the, the three main comics that, as you said, were previously published by Avery Hill. And you go back in time and realize she, like, we're not taken back that far in terms of quality. Like, she, at the age of 16, she was doing stellar work. It's, like, incredible seeing some of the things that she, uh, that she made. And, like, it's really hard to pick a favorite from that shortlist. So I'll, I think we should cover the three main stories at the very least and, like, go over what they are. And it's funny because it starts with, the story The End of Summer, which initially I had a really hard time following. Um, it was my least favorite when I initially read this book. Um, and I, I thought many of the characters were like really difficult to tell apart. And it was basically just this abstract tale of a, a winter lasting for three years and a regal dysfunctional family dealing with the consequences of that. And so setting aside that I found the, the narrative a little bit confusing, the style, the artwork of it, it's set in this um, like really grand, oversized, opulent castle with this amazing sense of architecture. Like the setting is so well realized with these like giant windows and luxurious beds and grand halls. Um, it's all really, uh, like I said, regal and like almost like a cathedral. And I, that's basically the, the joy that I took from it was seeing the construction of this, this space and the way that these people existed in it and like just how it seemed kind of off kilter because everything was just so oversized and so bombastic and it's just, it was wild. And then I think this initial confusion that I had, I'm willing to blame on my own inattentiveness because I read it again this morning and so much of what I found confusing became a lot more legible. 
And because I was paying a bit more attention, like I said before, I thought some of the characters were difficult to tell apart, but there are some very clear tells about, like, uh, you know, very distinct who each character is. And, like, the if you're following the thread and paying just a little bit more attention than is perhaps demanded of a normal, I say, quote-unquote, normal comic book. Like, this is... It feels a lot more artistic in, in this sense. It almost reminds me of reading, like, a... Um, like a novel that's uh, like a magical realism novel uh, where I sometimes struggle with those. But once you get into it, there's, you know, you get drawn along and you, you fall into the, the abstractness of it all. And so all of these moments between these characters who previously I didn't fully understand, it became this thing where their relationships and affections for each other, which previously were clouded or unspoken or like veiled by her, when they became clear, all those moments became really wonderful and delicate and tragic. And I think this really warranted a second read. Like I just got so much more out of it. And it's like going back to the magical realism thing I mentioned, I think there's a lot of this like hidden meaning behind certain rules that go left un, um, like unrevealed, but in a way that sort of adds to the flavor of the world that they're in. And mm. like the idea of this family being trapped in this massive house but sending like half of their i because it opens with them sending people out of the building uh when they've got like a 10 minute countdown before they close the doors for good for the you know the three years that they're trapped inside in and it made me wonder like they still kept their servants in the house and they still you know have people to cook for them and care for them so who are they sending away like why couldn't they keep people into in this place which looks like it's such a a good safeguard against the harsh outside world which we're we we only see very little of like all of these things really add up to add to the mystique of this story um and it culminates in a way that i found really touching on my second read like understanding how all the pieces were falling into place and like what was what i was beginning to understand was actually happening like i don't get this very often reading comics but like my heart lurched at a particular page flip in in this first story and i'm just really curious to see if you guys got the same out of it oh yeah if i'm thinking of the same bit as you then yeah <laughs> <laughs> like so i mean the most striking thing is like about the work in general here in in this in this whole book is like tilly's ability to like fully bring you into the narrative like she makes you feel it like the comics don't just tell you a story they make you feel it so there's so much packed into this like beautiful delicate line work it's whimsical it's fantastic she plays with scale in very interesting beautiful ways giant figures sitting amongst city skylines and skyscrapers and tower blocks and tall bla- like skyscrapers and tower blocks that are like tall blades of grass or plants in a meadow surrounding these forms and like ethereal dreamy quality which is like the central theme to all of the work and like there's a foreword in this book and if you read the foreword and then you go through the rest of the book you can't not see it there's like this central theme in all the work and it it, it can be traced back to like Tilly's love and appreciation of Little Nemo in Slumberland which is a turn of the 20th century book um like comic strip which is like by by Winsor McKay and it's just it's like really um like I'm not entirely sure how to like describe it it's like really uh surreal and it's like um like dream it's like dreamland aesthetic it's really surreal and it has this kind of like um turn of the century kind of feel to it with with like you know like the way things are presented like clowns and 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 things just look they had they have that kind of that that aesthetic which i can't i have no other way of of describing it other than saying the the little nemo aesthetic because (laughs) because that aesthetic is what's gone on to feed a lot of other things like when we mentioned lock and key at the top of this episode that aesthetic goes on to inform how that open the moon book looks later on because it just has that that dream world aesthetic that that classic turn of the century dream world aesthetic which is something that kind of informs the way that um especially well especially the first comic in this collection um the end of summer it, it informs the way that looks like massively and 
it's just one of those things where it's like in my head all of a sudden lots of things connected up and I'm just like oh yeah like because then I've been like reading Winsor McKay comics like these these short Nemo and Slumberland pages and from that I've just been like oh like all these other things in my head just connect and it's like that's where that was probably born that weird surreal turn of the century dreamland aesthetic that gets used in so many places like uh the the antiquity of it and um even down to things like uh melancholy and the infinite sadness by mm. um uh smashing pumpkins like the the album design and everything else in that it just inform it just informed all of those things but yeah so so that's like where this kind of comes from like the, the work wears its influences on its sleeve and it's nice. I love it. And it celebrates those influences in a really loving and thoughtful way. And there's small details in the way pages and panels are formed in character designs. And it's just gorgeous. It's like, yeah, the, the, the amazing introduction to the piece, this, this, to the collection by Warren Bernard just puts all of this into perspective and context for the reader. And it just puts a whole new dimension on it and a way to appreciate every page. Like, so yeah, my favorite piece in this book is the end of summer, which is absolutely gorgeous. Like mm. the whole story is black and white. It feels like a dream, a hazy reality, just this fantastic place. Like tensions and feelings just kind of like leap off the page and the forms we see in the panels, just vessels waiting to be knocked over. So all of this can just like spill out onto us and around us. It's these like delicate lines just designed to just kind of like pour it out and just let it flow. And then it gives way to this beautiful architectural detail and intricate mechanical machinery and technical drawings and mm. it's this gorgeous place filled with silence. But beneath the surface, it roars and crashes like an ocean. And I'm going to shut up and let Leon talk now because <laughs> I've just gone on and on and on and on. But yeah. Um, so, yeah, Leon, uh, thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I echo everything you guys said about um, the book as a whole and particularly um, the end of summer story. Um, going into this, um, I had read I Love This Part before, mm. oh, okay. and um, last late last year, um, I'd read On a Sunbeam, mm, uh, yeah. but like then we hit the Christmas period where we had all the special episodes that I never got a chance to speak speak about it on the cast, but it is one that I'd like to revisit and ha- us to like properly dive in, because um, it's really good. And um, yeah, I think this book is is a really good, not even intro. I think it's a really good, like thesis statement for like Warden's work, mm. and I think ver- various different aspects of that are are wrapped up in the stories that are in here. Um, whether that be in the three large uh, like main stories or in the um, uh, the shorts that we get um, uh, after. And there's, I think one of the things that I really like um, that happens, especially uh, uh, like mostly across the, these bigger stories is um, there's I, it, like for me, like memory is like a series of like disparate moments um, surrounded by ellipsis where almost dreamlike oftentimes i can't remember like for older memories like when i was younger i can't remember the beginning and i can't remember the end but i remember the particular thing and i remember with the film boyhood richard link later said uh, i'm gonna like misquote him but it's something along the lines of um like when it comes to like memory of the past and stuff you don't remember like the graduation ceremony you remember driving from graduation to get hot dogs and stuff. And it's, and it's like, mm. um, that I think is like very much real and very much uh, applicable to me. And I really like within these stories, everything that you guys said, but also on top of that, it's this almost this feeling of like stealing little moments a lot of the time, especially when it's like, uh, two or three characters speaking, with each other and then you have sort of a jump of time uh, there's something really engaging for me with stuff like that because it allows me to a degree to fill in 
those gaps about how said characters get from 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 A to B, and I think it has this like stealth way of really gut 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 punching you after you've spent a bunch of time. Cause in essence, you spent even longer with, with these people, uh, than you really notice. And I think that, that, that sort of sense of like stolen moments and, um, little bits, uh, leading up to a larger whole, uh, are really, really, um, really impactful and especially like uh so like the story i'd read before i love this part um that's one where like in the 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 introduction that warren bernard does as well as uh mentioning the the mckay books also mentions uh like miyazaki so studio uh julie movies and i really feel that um throughout uh where like i've mentioned before those movies often have this sort of heightened reality dreamlike state in a, in a lot of uh, uh Miyazaki um Ghibli movies and I do get that feeling here where there's almost like a haze in a way like just outside of the windows just uh, around the corner um and there there's no there's no belabored connective tissue with all of this stuff is that it's informed by character choices and what characters say and what characters don't say, and this sort of snippets of um, of like visuals and um, expression that that we see from um, from page to page, um, where like sometimes you'll just get instead um, like sort of engineering diagrams and th- like it's like a layered sort of metaphor on you, but it doesn't feel like mega on the nose. And like mm. uh, stuff like that works like really well for me, um, and like I, I really loved like the the um, I guess it's like layout because it's really a series of um, like splash pages to a degree because it's like one image per page for the most part on the middle story. I love this part and just the the visual look of like like sort of teenage girls just like lounging on buildings and stuff and uh like large in these like vistas of like um sort of town city and, and like seaside seaside uh mountains industrial settings there's like it has that magic of like those sort of lost summers you could have as a kid. Mm. Mm. Whether your lost summers were like um, romance based or like even friend based, or even if it was just spending the whole summer inside playing video games, there's still sort of a um, intangible magic um, with like the long summer, which even though I've been out of the education system for so long, I still feel it to a degree mm. now, even though yeah. I work with summers. Um, like, I still feel it to a degree, This um, because the days are long and um, there's an endless possibility. And that's not to say this this story is even set during the summer, but mm. more so that's the, the, the feeling that it, it triggers in me. And when I think back to, like, sort of friendships and, and like, relationships and stuff, when I was... Um, like younger, there is this it's like fuzziness where I remember these certain moments, but I don't remember how I got there. And I really love how we skip around, but I don't feel like I feel like I, I get so much of the um, emotion from from this story. Actually, reading reading it again, that mm. um, like I just find it so so effective. And like just just like a simple like having a panel of like an empty classroom. Or like uh, like lockers in the hallway and having the, the single like musical note, uh, it conveys so much in terms of like what's come before and the the whole premise around of like the sort of the mixtape you make for a friend. Uh, yeah, yeah it, it's it's s- s- uh, slightly powerful and um, it's it's a thing that's normally very much my jam and 
and in this case it, it it still is my jam but um like extending out and out to like the the fight the the final of the three main stories i just i did love how sort of um because it's white and black and there's a lot of like um sort of negative space where it's like the sky the night sky will just be a black block and then then the like white starts to appear in between the lines like i really love the look of that and it, it it builds such a presence that um when you have uh the words that, that that do come up it's very poetic and um it gives the um and it, it gives like a a sort of ethereal timelessness to to the whole thing and all this sounds like sort of waffle like i'm just putting words together but it really is the best way i, I can best words i can find to to um to like denote what is a very like ethereal and complex set of um uh like things that i feel the the uh, these stories are doing um but yeah like to to go to my starting point i do feel like this is a very good um way in for people to access uh, Walden's work. And I think that you do get a very um, comprehensive uh, insight into the strengths of, of her writing, but also like um, how, how across the years, um, though she's really honed those storytelling skills and um, like, as as you get like closer uh, as you move through time um you see how she's re- re- uh, refined um mm. like certain techniques and uh, angles at, at, at yeah. telling particular stories and um that's that's what really really resonates for me so, yeah and I, I, sorry go on greg sorry i was gonna say there's some super interesting like page and panel layouts used here and some really cool techniques with perspective and everything and like even the short com, the, then you've got these short comics and works that appear later in the collection. And I was going to bounce off what Leon was saying by like, it's a real insight into her process and how she works, like how her work evolved and her influences. And it's nice to see that stuff. And it's a rare thing to be able to appreciate it and then go back and look at its bearing on the later works. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause uh, like how her work evolves, we get the context sort of, scattered throughout the book especially in the later bits where she gives a little like a very short preamble to what motivated some of the you know some of the shorts that we're reading and like it gives you a a reason to sort of go back and reevaluate stuff previously so like for example with the the comic i love this part that um you were talking about the second one of the the three big ones Mm. um like she states later that this is her comfort zone the you know the uh the rendering of girls the color purple giant bodies in a tiny city, you know, and it's this gorgeous vignette of the ebb and flow of a relationship. Like it's really nice seeing that, that like these moments where she describes what, what it means to her and like how it's like a safe space for her or whatever. And like to, to go back to that comic specifically, cause I didn't get a chance to talk about it. I love that that story is about like these two girls discovering each other and discovering what love means to themselves and relative to each other and how grand it feels in the setting that they're put in and like, you know, you get these really gorgeous full page shots of them, you know, throwing furtive glances at each other. And there's a really moving page where one of the girls is tangled up in her headphones. Like she's as though she's tangled up in herself and like she's tangled up in her feelings while she's expressing that she's not like the other one. And part of that where like she's tangled in her headphones, I found her throughout the book, there's a real love for technology as well, which isn't really on display in the first story but i'll get back to that in a second but like um i love this part has um ipods and iphones really lovingly rendered um and like and the things that these items provide to us so they you know these the girls are constantly sharing music with each other and there's some level of tactility and touch in these devices when they're distant from each other and like there's a there's a, a point where they're sharing music, but they're not in the same space. But, you know, one of them has the phone up to her mouth, which is a really, like, you've got a really tactile sense from that where she's crying into her phone about it. And it's, those moments are really touching. I think there's something really, like, unspoken, un, um, it doesn't have to be said out, like, shouted out. It's more just 
you connect the dots and you get the the sense of these feelings. And like one thing I wanted to talk about with the first story, so the end of summer, like again, getting some of the context from later on uh, in the book, she mentions how she tried to move away from using a ruler to find more abstracted shapes in this, you know, this more nebulous story that she drew. But I kind of, I loved the rigidity of the, the, the setting of this story and like how it um, contrasts with the wafy animated characters that she's drawing. And like, as you mentioned, Greg, there's, it's really evident her love for structured construction um, in like the mechanical drawings that she scatters yeah. throughout this, and this the huge architecture. grand space and the architecture and like yeah. the house looms over the characters. It's casting like really harsh shadows against itself, but really soft shadows on the, the characters and like her watercolor strokes work really well to that effect. Mm. And I think this, it, it's a thing that I have a hard time describing, but like you get this really good sense of like, like Leon was saying, um, it's, the sense of scale and time is mythical in the way that like summer holidays are mythical, you know, um, because they're nebulous at the edges and you're just existing in those moments as you are. And yeah, I've never seen, or I wouldn't say never, but like, I rarely see something um, express that as well as this has. You've got like ghosts wandering huge hallways. Mm. Because that's what that, that's what the end of summer is for me. Like yeah, and, and then, it's like there's there's a stillness. Like it's all about yeah. winter. Everything's there's a stillness. There's a frozen, unchanging thing. But they're aging, and you don't get to see the the yeah. huge gaps between the jumps in that timeline. And then you've got like later on, you've got like these. This is what I was when when you're talking about like the, uh, the 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 cityscapes and things like playing with scale and whatever. This is what I was mm-hmm. when Leon refers to like the, these girls. Um, lounging around huge cities <laughs> this is mm. this is uh, huge girls lounging around cities this is what i was saying when it's like being so seeing someone lying down in down in a meadow except instead of grass it's buildings mm. and it, it it really gives me that kind of like that's what i feel when i look at it it's like someone like just chilling under a tree in a meadow surrounded by tallish weeds you know um and it really does have that summer feel about it and it's yeah it's beautiful. And I'm just going to pick some favorites from later on, actually, because I've got some favorites from the, the, the single page ones later on, the sort of like the, um, the, the earlier works. Um, so I really like um, Slumberland, which is one of her CCS assignments that was given to her by Jason Lutz, um, according to the little blurb. And um, I really like that as like an homage to the Nemo and Slumberland stuff. And again, to this, this, this dream aesthetic that I seem to be like all about right now. Um, and then, um, and I, I can largely attribute that actually to this book, <laughs> having looked at this. And then there was, um, the weather woman, um, oh. which was another one I really, really liked because I liked the concept of it. Um, and then, um, there was a third one, that I was really into, which was um, the the one about the end of the universe towards the end of the book. Um, the fade, the fader. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The one done for the fader magazine, yeah, yeah, where she tries to get more, way more abstra- abstract. Um, yeah, that's the one I was referring to where she says yeah. she's trying to move away from using a ruler. Yeah. yeah, that one's cool because it's it's my jam with all these that one's like, gorgeous. All forms and stuff. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I really love the use of color in that one. Yeah, mm. but yeah, those. I mean, like all of the whole book's great, and I I think it's a valuable piece for the shelf of anyone who's a fan of the comics medium. I really do, mm. um, because yeah, there's just so I, much. Like, sorry, what were you going to say? No, I was going to agree with you and say I can't wait for this to come out like in yeah. physical form. I want yeah. to not read this on my iPad. I want to be able to hold it in my hand. Same. And, like, yeah. Get that pre-order down. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> no, but there's just there's just so much in here and there's just so much to, to kind of like pour over and look at and just so many different techniques and things to look at and, and enjoy. And and just like just I love looking at creative process. Mm. Like with stuff like this, with comics. Like I love looking at how like page breakdowns and things like that. And and I love seeing in this in this book, I love seeing someone's kind of like creative process and and style kind of like laid out over you know like with with the the collection of early stuff that we've got in the back 
like how this is built kind of thing like how how it builds up to something else and it's just it's just incredible like yeah i'm really into it so um well yeah. leon did you have a favorite of the uh, of the shorter ones towards the end um i would say it was probably between the fader one and what it's like to be gay in an all girls middle school because mm. I found that one to be, again, it was um, it's like a condensed version of the stuff that I I quite like of uh, of Warden's w- uh, work in in the, in the larger ones, but that one's more condensed and feels um, like autobiographical and almost uh, journalistic in some ways. Yeah, yeah, like it appeals to the the thing like the slice of life thing that I really enjoy. Yeah, I can, I can see, I get that pick. I think mine would be Lost Trees, which is only like two or three pages, I think. Where it's, it starts off with a shot of some trainers, which I always love. And then it's um, like about a girl walking through uh, a thick forest dappled in light and playing with these like dip-dab tones of pink and orange. And it has this really good scrambling sense of adventure and panic and like breathless discovery. And like to... To be able to express that in just two pages is incredible. Like, I was blown away. Yeah. So, um, that is Alone in Space. Um, that is um, by Tilly Walden. And uh, that is published by Avery Hill. And that is going to be available this summer. So, if you're in the US, uh, that's going to be the 6th of July. In the UK, 10th of June, and uh, you can pre order it now on the Avery Hill website. So, yeah, um, I think that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Um, I got no pull list for you this time. Um, oh my god, yeah, I didn't compile anything. I didn't, <laughs> to be honest, right? I'm getting to the point now where because we're in this, this kind of like lockdown thing, and it's like I'm getting to the point where I'm, I'm feeling like there, there's no there is no pull list. <laughs> it's just, it's just because you just, you just buy what you want to read. You buy what you feel. You buy what makes you feel good. You look at the comics on Comicsology. You look at what, what you can afford on, on uh, books, online bookshops and things like that. It, or maybe if your LCS is doing delivery at the moment, or maybe even if you can get to your LCS, just, you know, like I'm, I'm, I can tell you and, and tell you and tell you what I'm excited for right now. But at the moment, I, I think it's just like, you gotta, you gotta do like, especially what I'm doing. I'm just, I'm just buying things to the comics that comfort me. Like the, I, like I, I wanted to read Jack Kirby's Eternals, so I bought Big Old Eternals book. You know, it's just, and and it, it's just, it's just, you do, you, you do you. <laughs> I guess it, is it, what I want to say. It's funny seeing that picture of Keanu Reeves like picking up his own comic, um, when, you know, yeah. buying buying Berserker issue number one. It's like, why does he get to be in a comic book shop? Like, I really miss comic book shops. It's it's so weird seeing that. Imagine being there when he did that and just grabbing mm. one off the shelf and being like, mate, sign one for me, please. Because <laughs> <laughs> you love like Keanu. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's, um, it's, it's some kind of insanity. It really is. And like, I, you know, like imagine being in your LCS and then Keanu Reeves walks in, like just. That's not the point com- I was getting at though. I'm just jealous of Keanu Reeves getting to go to a comic book shop. <laughs> like that's, that's my grievance. I'm jealous of it too. And I think he was there <laughs> undercover, like looking for a gang of comic mm. book fans that have been robbing banks and then using those, <laughs> the money to pay for their collections. <laughs> <laughs> or wearing different masks for different villains. You've got dark side Thanos, Dr. D. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to shut up about point break one day. I promise. But yeah. Um, so yeah, that has been Ace Comicals episode 108. So you can find us in all the places you can normally find podcasts. Uh, everything we do is at www.acecomicals.com. Um, you can also now find us on YouTube. We're available there now to listen to. So uh, all of our previous and future episodes will be available on YouTube. Um, you can find us on Twitter under at Ace Comicals, which is where we are most vocal and most present. Um, at us, DM us, email us, whatever. Um, we have an email address, which is acecomicals at gmail.com. 
Um, you can find me on Twitter under at Bato. Um, just, you know, talk to me about comics. That's what I'm there for. Um, it's pretty much the only reason I'm on social media these days. Um, that and uh, silly cat videos. Ray, where can we find <laughs> you? <laughs> on Twitter at Monkey, M-O-O-N-K-E-H. And Leon, where can we find you? You can find me on Twitter at Leon Everett. And I just want to say, uh, to say a little bit, I just want to like give some solidarity with like uh, Asian American, Pacific Islander, and Asian people all over. Because obviously, in like the last year, we've seen increased attacks towards Asian people, um, and now culminating with like the terrible events we had in Atlanta this past week. Just want to like uh, make sure that uh, we all like try to like do some reading and research and donate what we can and step in and be an ally when needed and uh, ultimately to stop Asian hate. Greed. And that is Ace Comicals 108. Uh, Ace Comicals over and out.